Save the day. It is our annual church conference. Amen. Shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's easy for 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 some people naturally to to find a reason to shout to the Lord, uh, uh, and and for others, it's not it's not always easy to to find those reasons. Uh, but let me tell you, you're gonna find a reason to shout to the Lord. Amen. This conference is gonna be like nothing else. Amen. Uh, that's all for announcements, but if anybody's ready to give, if anybody is ready to give, let's give. Amen. Let's give. Second Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to read two verses in, out of the message translation. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. I know, I know you guys have heard this. In verse 6 and 7, it says, remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make up your own mind on what you will give. You know, I've, I've, been, I've been taught uh, as, a, as a younger Christian that uh, to not think about giving when you're here in church. Think about giving before you get to church. Think about giving before you get ready in the morning. Think about giving before you're on your way into, into church. Think about it. Contemplate it so that when you're here, you're actually ready to give. That way, nobody up here like me, like my pretty mug, is, is up here bending your arm, telling you, empty your wallet. I mean, if we did that, wouldn't we be, th- like, like, wouldn't we be you know, mugging you? But that's not, well, that's not what we do. So before you get to church, think about what it is you want to give. According to Scripture, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your own mind what you will give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. When, when, when I finally got my first full-time job as a Christian, uh, I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to just ride by with a, with a minimum tithe gift, with, with the very minimum, and anything beyond that. I remember my first $20 gift of giving and and it was it was so stressful. My first twenty dollars, and now I get more than twenty dollars. I'm able to. God has blessed me, so I'm able to give more than that now. But it was it was it was so much. It was it was man. It was an arm bar to give that. Uh, but but now now I'm thinking about okay, what am I going to give? How much am I going to give? Why am I going to give? And I'm thinking about this before I ever come into the house of God. So there's no arm bars today. But an encouragement. If you've thought about what you want to give today, then let's give it. The last Sunday of 2020. So today, think about what you want to give. You have maybe a minute to do that. If you've not already thought about it. And we're going to give. There's a lot of ways to give. You can go to powerhouseoc.org, which is our website. You can text to give, 714-710-1981. You can, you can call 562-298-7145 during normal business hours. And you can give that way. And when you give, be excited about it. If you aren't excited about giving, you might have to just hold on to it. Maybe release it. Maybe hold on to it. I don't know. I can't tell you what to do with your money. But if you thought about it, if you considered it, then I want to, when, when, you, when, you, when you put it in the basket, when you hit send on text to give, when you go online and you do it that way, Whatever it is you do, do. Put a smile on as soon as you hit that, that sin button. As soon as you, you know, signs to deliver, God, it's yours. And then, and then wait for him to do something. I'm not going to say he's going to return a stimulus check into your, into your pocket the next day. But whatever he chooses to do, be expected that he's going to do something. You did your part cheerfully. Wait for him to do his part even, even more cheerfully and abundantly. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful we get the opportunity to give cheerfully, God. God, help us touch our heart today, God. Open our heart, God, to your word. God, as we give today, God, let it be, God, an entry into a new season, ready for all that you have for us. In Jesus' name we all pray. Thank you. Amen and amen. And I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm.
Amen. How's everybody doing this morning? Good to be in the house of God. I thank you all for coming today. If this is your first time here, welcome to Powerhouse. We want to welcome you and we pray that you are blessed today and encouraged by the word today as well. Uh, before we get into the word this morning, we do have a baby dedication that we want to go ahead and present today. At this time, if we can have uh, Isaac and Nani Martinez come up, come forward. And uh, they are going to be dedicating. Are they here? Oh, they're getting their son. They're going to be dedicating their son, Claus Martinez. Not Santa Claus, but Claus. Claus Martinez this morning. Amen. Amen. Again, we want to encourage you to come out next week uh, or this Wednesday as well. It's our last Wednesday service of the year. And next Sunday will be the first service of 2021. How many excited for 2021? <laughs> excited. No perfect way to start the year than being in the house of God. Amen. And serving God. And, and uh, we, we're excited. We're looking forward to it. So uh, we can't wait to see you. So Nani and Isaac will be bringing up. <laughs> And dedicating their, ch their child. You know, I want to just share real, real briefly of why we dedicate our children. And uh, for those who have not yet dedicated their child or children to God and would, are interested in doing that. Uh, again, if you are, please see uh, Sister Josie, who is just walking right now across with her hand waving. She's the one that you want to go see right after service. And uh, she'll go set that up for you for next month. But again, the reason why... Uh, we dedicate, or the purpose of dedication is that uh, we are making a public statement of faith to raise our children under God's grace and wisdom. Amen? And uh, it's also a symbolic moment of entrusting God's, uh, your child in the hands of God, his will. Amen? And so when you're dedicating your child to God, it shows that you recognize that your child is a gift from God. Amen? And that you are dedicating yourself to being, listen to this, parents, you are you are dedicating yourself to being a godly parent, a godly example to your child or your children. So you're not just dating, dedicating your child to God, but you yourself are dedicating yourself to be a godly example. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in, in 3 John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, I could have no greater joy than to hear that my children are following the truth. One way that our children are going to follow the truth is by the example that you set for them. And so it's not just the church's responsibility to set the example for your children, but you play the greatest role for your child to follow, as the scripture says here, to follow the truth is by you leading by example. Because your children will learn by when they're at home and they watch mom and dad on how, they're, how they act, how they speak you know, the, the things that they do. And so, again, our children are going to imitate what we do, right? So they're going to imitate us. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 7 says, And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and you must commit yourself wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Listen to that. Talk about them when you are at home and when you are on the road when you are going to bed, and when you are getting up. So again, you are the example to your children. You are to set that example. So don't just assume that when you bring them to church, it's the teachers that are back there is the responsibility to teach your kids about the Word of God. First, it's you as an adult, as a parent. You had these children. You had them. So you raised them. So don't just bring them and say, okay, here, teach them. And then you go home and you and, and they forget everything because now you're doing the opposite of what they were being taught. Are you hearing me? Don't get quiet on me to, this morning. The scripture tells us that as parents, we are to love who? Love God. We are to love God and we truly desire to see our children or our child, so, you know, one day love and follow God. We ourselves need to set that example. Amen. And so at this time, we're going to have uh, 
I'm going to allow Nani or Isaac, if they want to just share a few words, uh, you are able to. You don't have to, but I wanna, we, want, we like to encourage people of why they would like to dedicate their child or children to the Lord, or just share something real briefly if you'd like to. <laughs> All right, well, since I signed him up. <laughs> um, we wanted to dedicate him because it's about that time, you know, uh, but we found more importantly a church um, that we can call. Do I want you? <laughs> Send us out. Um, that we can call a home. Um, we didn't feel comfortable at the other churches that we went to, so we didn't really, um, you know, have that in our mind to dedicate it, dedicate him there. Um, and then once, you know, we came here, you know, we are all family, so <laughs> we're like, hey, what a better place, you know? So. Amen. So at this time, we're going to go ahead and pray. We want to pray for the parents, Isaac and Nani, and we're also going to be praying for Claus as well. Amen. And just praying for God's uh, protection over his life, protection for God's will to be done in his life. And we're going to pray that, you know, that God would give Nani and Isaac the strength and the wisdom to raise and train Claus in the ways of God. Amen. Because that is what we want to do is to train our child and through their exampleship that he will follow and serve God as he grows up. Amen. And does God's will. Amen. So I want you to stretch your right hand. Amen. As, and come in agreement with us as we pray. Amen. My wife, she can come over here. And we're going to just pray. And you guys can just agree with us this morning. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We lift up Nani, Lord. Lord, we pray for her as a mom, Lord, as a wife, that she would set that example. Lord, that she would love on claws, Lord, that she would, uh, on her children, Lord, that she would uh, lead by example, pray and intercede for them, Lord, and Lord, Lord, speak life into them. I pray, give her wisdom to, to make right choices and decisions, Lord, and Lord, as her sons look at her, that they would see the love of God in her, that they would see, God, that she is a woman of God, that she, that she prays, Lord, and she knows you, and she's, Lord, leading by example, Lord, I pray for Isaac as well, Lord, that he would be the man of the house, Lord, that he would lead by example, Lord, I pray that he would as well pray and intercede, God, for his children, his boys, Lord, and, and lead them and train them in your ways, God. So I pray, give him wisdom, Lord. Give him the tools that he needs, Lord, to impart, Lord, and deposit into these boys' lives that they will grow up and be mighty warriors, mighty men of God that will serve you, God, and do your will, Lord. I pray for Claus, Lord, and I pray that even at a young age, that your hand would be upon his life, Lord. I pray protect him, God. I pray for his health, that you would protect him, Lord. And God, guide him and direct him, Lord, at a young age, Lord. And I pray that, God, that, Lord, that you would plant seeds into him, Lord. And, Lord, I pray that, God, that your will, God, uh, would be done in his life. And I pray that he would grow up, Lord, and know you and live for you, God. So I thank you right now for this precious family, God, what you are doing right now in their lives, God that you are building them, you are, Lord, uh, you are restoring God, you are grounding them, Lord, and you are doing something new and something fresh, Lord, and we just pray that you continue, God, to be upon them, that you would be the center of their home, God, the center of their life, and God, that they would all come together, and Lord, that they will serve you all the days of their life. We thank you right now, Father, we give you all the glory and all the praise in Jesus' name, and all of God's people shout and said, amen. amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. You can take pictures if, if they like to take more pictures on the side there. Amen. And again, we want to thank you, uh, everyone, for being here this morning. We're excited again for our conference that is coming up uh, just about two and a half weeks. We're excited for that. We pray that you would come out, be here with us. Again, it's Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. Uh, women as well. You guys will be having a women's discipleship that Monday. Amen. So uh, you can never get enough of church and enough of God. Amen. So we're excited about what God's going to do that week. And so be prepared. Start sharing with family and friends. We want to just see God move and expecting that just the God to just do something powerful that weekend. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Other than that, we're going to have our, our evangelist come up and share the word this morning. So I want you to put your hands together for David. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Amen. Hope everybody had a nice Merry Christmas. Amen. 
know is a little bit different this year. <clears throat> Seems like um, a lot of the people that I know have got COVID right now. Um, so our family can't even get together at all. Um, so I hope some of your guys' families were able to get together. Uh, but we had a chance to stay home and we, we uh, made some tamales. We cooked a ham on Friday. We made empanadas yesterday. And I am still full. Amen. But, and we're going to have some food for the next couple of days. So thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, <clears throat> pastors have been talking about this next year coming up. And they believe God put it upon their heart that this is the year of the shout. Amen. So we're coming into the year of the shout. Before we can get to a shout, there needs to be a surrendering. There needs to be a consecration to the Lord. Amen. All month long, the pastor has been preaching about getting your heart right with the Lord. And then as did Pastor Rosie and Brother Joe, and Brother Richard, Brother Steve. Amen. I wish I could say that that we need to surrender just because we should be doing that anyway. But the truth is that there's no more time to be riding the fence. There's no more time to be playing around. There's no time to be playing with sin. Because the time of Jesus' return is near. Amen. We need to get our hearts right and be ready for the end time revival that God is sending. And to be ready for the return of Christ. Amen. God's great salvation is, is coming full circle. Amen. Let's pray today. Father, you are our resting place, Lord. We magnify you today. We thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Help us, Lord, to understand the times that we live in, Father. May we, may we be like those five virgins that have that oil in their lamps ready for your return. Every person that is here today is here because you appointed them to be. So I pray that your purpose be accomplished today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today I'm going to begin on speaking a two-part series on the subject of mystery Babylon the Great. Okay, I'll be speaking this two parts, so it'll be one today and one on this coming Wednesday. You do not want to miss the one on Wednesday. I'm letting you know right now, okay? The, the first thing that we need to understand about the times that we live in is that even though judgment has been prophesied, <clears throat> in the end times, revival has also been prophesied, okay? So somebody has to be here to lead those people to Jesus, amen? A couple weeks ago, I had two dreams back to back, and I, I, don't, I usually like one of those type that never remember your dreams, but when God gives me something, I remember it, and I, I remember getting up and immediately going to my desk and writing down what I had saw, um, and, and I knew right away that God had answered two questions that I had about this message. In the first dream, um, I was on a, an L-shaped deck, okay, in the water, and I was ready to go fishing. And a big wave came underneath the deck and almost knocked me into the water. And I, I immediately knew that I was probably in the ocean versus, you know, being in the lake. Okay, and so here I am on this L-shaped deck, and I could see underneath the other side of the deck over there, and I could see that there were large fish under there, like the size of sharks. Okay, so, uh, so I said to myself, man, I got all excited. I said, man, I'm going to get a big fish today, right? I was all happy. And immediately, I understood that God was going to bring big fish to us. And that the, that the people that are stubborn, the people that are proud, the people that are hard to reach, that they're going to be hungry and searching for answers, right? So before, we used to have to go great distances to reach people like that. But God's saying that the, the revival that is coming that he's gonna, it's going to be so great that he's going to even bring the deep sea fish into the shallows ready to be saved. Amen. The second dream that I had, God was answering a question I had about fear in the time of judgment. See, it's a fearful time right now in our nation, especially for Christians. And God reminded me of the plagues uh, of Egypt, the 10 plagues. And he said, do you remember that one that was when the 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 the, all of Egypt was dark for three days. The Bible says that it was so dark, it literally says this, that you could touch it or you could feel it, how dark it was. And for three days, the Egyptians had to crawl around just trying to feel around to try to do something because it was pitch black. 
However, 100 yards away is the Israel camp, and it's complete daylight in, in Israel, but complete darkness in Egypt. And God is saying that in the time of judgment that we do not have to fear that he will be our light in the midst of darkness. So do not fear. Amen. Judgment, persecution, injustice, all make for a great opportunity for great revival. Okay. So don't stop believing. Don't give up hope. We still have this hope that leads us behind the veil. Amen. Okay. So this prophecy that we're about to go over was spoken by three different prophets in the Bible, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and John the Apostle, and they called it a mystery, okay? Now, in the West, when we think of a mystery, we think of a puzzle or a riddle or something like that, uh, but when a Hebrew thinks of a mystery, they think of a secret that has not yet been revealed, okay? And so, as God said in Daniel chapter 12, verse 9, that there are some prophecies that will not be revealed until the end times. Amen. How many know that we live in the end times? Amen. So people that study the Bible can tell you that the Bible is a tale of two cities. There is the city of man, Babylon, and then there's the city of God, Jerusalem. Okay. Babylon was a great nation of the past that, that was judged harshly by God. And in the end times, Bible prophecy says that there will be a nation that has the same characteristics as Babylon or ancient Babylon, and that to the same degree that God blessed this nation, that in that same degree, he's going to judge that nation. And in one hour, they will be entirely, entirely laid to waste and destroyed by fire. So who is this great nation and why is it important to us? Okay, so let's start by checking out the characteristics of this place called Babylon the Great and see if we can't figure out who and where this place is, and then we'll understand why it's important to us. Okay, so let's go to Revelation, uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stone and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Okay, now the two biggest theories uh, are that Mystery Babylon is either a religious system rather than a nation, but a religious system based in Rome, which would be the Catholic Church, and a lot of people believe that. I would even say most people believe that, or that it's the United States. So let's go to the first clue. Uh, number one, Mystery Babylon is the youngest of the great nations. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 12. <clears throat> Your mother shall be sore confounded, she that bear you shall be ashamed. Behold, the hindermost of the nations shall be a wilderness, a dry land, and a desert. Okay, so Jeremiah is prophesying about Mystery Babylon, and he calls her the hindermost of the nations. Okay, hinder meaning the last or the youngest, and most meaning great. Mystery Babylon is the last or the youngest of the great nations to be born on the earth. Okay, so first of all, in this, the scripture is teaching us that Master uh, Mystery Babylon is a nation or a great city, but it's not a religious system. Okay. Secondly, was Rome the last of the great nations to be born on the earth? Which great nation was the last great nation to rise to power on the earth and is still in power? Okay. Number two. Where is the location of Mystery Babylon? Well, let's go to Revelation 17, verses 1, 3, 9, and 15. 
17, verses 1, 3, 9, and 15. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Okay, so many waters right here in verse 15 symbolically means many peoples. Okay, it means Mystery Babylon will be a nation that is made up of many different kinds of cultures, uh, nationalities, and languages. Okay, how many nations in the world can say that? Secondly, many waters also physically reveals the location of Mystery Babylon. It says it, it will sit on many waters. And, and also, verse 9 also says that it will sit on seven mountains. Okay, here's a map of Rome. You can bring that up, a map of Rome. Almost all historians believe that Mystery Babylon is Rome because Rome is the only city in the world that sits on seven hills. You can see the seven names right there. The problem is, is Rome is a city. It's not a nation, number one. And number two, it sits on seven hills, not seven mountains. Okay? In Scripture, mountains and hills are distinguished from each other. In fact, we're going to be reading a scripture from Jeremiah who is prophesying about Mystery Babylon, and then he mentions hills and mountains in the same scriptures, and they're distinguished from each other. Okay, So the city of Rome sits against the Tyrrhenian uh, Sea right there, but it doesn't sit on many waters. Maybe if it was Italy, but it's not. Okay, Let me ask you something. Where does a mountain actually begin and end? So we often think of a mountain kind of like a triangle, right? <laughs> you know, high at one part and then and wide at the bottom. Um, but the truth is, there are very few mountains that are shaped exactly like a triangle, if any at all. Um, if you were to follow a mountain from the top to the bottom, the mountain will, will be like start high, come down, maybe go into a valley, go back up a little bit, come back down, maybe go back up. And then it just keeps going and going and going it never actually ends until it gets to the end of the mountain range, right? So then something else I want you to consider, too, is I want you to consider the point of view of the prophet or the, this is the apostle John right here. Where did God place him when he showed him this vision, okay? If he placed him right in front of a mountain, he'd only be able to see one mountain, right? But he had to be up high enough to see seven mountains, and he had to be up high enough to be able to see that there was water, many waters there, right? Okay, so this is a, a map of the mountain ranges in the United States. And from this angle, you can see the mountains and the water. Notice that the United States sits on seven mountain ranges, and they have them named right there. Uh, the Brooks Range, the Alaska Range, the Coast Range, the Sierra Nevadas, the Cascades, the Rocky Mountains, and the Appalachian Mountains. There's only seven altogether. One right there says Sierra Madres, but that's Mexico. Okay, so there's seven. Also notice that the, the, the United States sits on many waters. The Pacific Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic Ocean. And if you wanted to be technical about it, because we've named these different areas, there's the Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, the Beaufort Sea, and the Great Lakes. Okay? What other clues are there? Let's continue. Mystery Babylon will have a high population of Jews. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah 51.6 and 51.45. Jeremiah 51.6 says, Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Jeremiah 51.45 says, My people... Go out from the midst of her and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Okay, from the 6th century B.C. until well into the early church age, the majority of the Jewish population lived in ancient Babylon, which is 
where Iraq and, uh, and Israel sit right now. Now, there are virtually no Jews left in Iraq, especially after ISIS had gone through there. Um, Rome, Rome has a small community of, of Jews. Today, the largest population of Jews, Jewish people in the world, are found in Israel and in the United States. Israel has 8 million Jews. The United States has 5.4 million Jews, totaling 13.4 million altogether. There's only 14.2 million Jews in all of the world. Okay? And God's not going to ask the Jews to leave Israel. Okay? Let's go to number four. Mystery Babylon is known as the hammer of the earth. Okay, let's go to Jeremiah 50, verse 23. How the hammer of the whole earth has been cut apart and broken. How Babylon has become a desolation among the nations. And let's go to Revelation 17, 18. And the, peop, the woman you, who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Okay, reigns in Greek means to have or hold royal power, kingship, dominion, or rule over. Okay, the Bible calls them the hammer of the earth. Okay, this was a Hebrew phrase that was used at one time to describe uh, the way the empires of Persia, Greece, and Rome applied their power to keep peace in the world. Okay, whenever there was a problem that threatened uh, the peace of their empire, they would go and crush it or get involved to make peace. Okay, now Rome used to have that power like 1,500 years ago. The Catholic Church surely doesn't have that power. When something goes bad in the world, most countries outside of the United States will say to themselves, when is the U.S. going to get involved and put this to a stop? For example, like ISIS, right? That would be a perfect example. The rest of the world expects us to take the upper road and do what's right with the power and influence that we have. Matthew, or not Matthew, May 25th, 2015, Pulitzer Prize winning author and foreign affairs expert Brett Stevens posted a YouTube video where he says, and I quote, the U.S. is the world's policeman and the whole world knows it and there is no alternative. Mystery Babylon is the hammer of the earth. Okay, let's go to number five. Mystery Bab Babylon is a land shadowed with buzzing wings. Okay, again, I want you to remember, think about the point of view of where the prophet is, when, where God positions him when he shows him this vision. Okay, let's go to Isaiah chapter 18, verse 1. Woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. Okay, beyond the, the rivers of Ethiopia. Let's go over that for a second. That's a phrase that is similar to a phrase like we use. Have you ever heard somebody say like Timbuktu? It's way out there. It's in Timbuktu, beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. That's the kind of saying that it is. Now God could have easily said, you know, like he did in numerous prophecies, woe to the land of Persia. Woe to the land of Assyria. But instead, he uses this Timbuktu kind of phrase, and I assert to you that he used it because this land had not been discovered at this time, and there was no name for it yet. Okay, let's continue. He says, woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings. Okay, this is a word picture right here of a shadow of a mighty eagle with its wings stretched out, its imperial wings. Okay, here's a picture of the shadow of an eagle. Okay, so the prophet continues and he says, the wings he sees are buzzing. Isaiah is looking into the future and sees something that has the shadow of an eagle, but it, as it's flying, it's making a buzzing sound. What was he describing? In 500, year BC, or 500 BC terminology, he was describing an airplane. Here goes the shadow of an airplane. He says this land is shadowed with buzzing wings. Do you know that every single day in the world, altogether, there is 50,000 flights taken around the world? Do you know how many of those flights are in the United States alone? 30,000 just in the United States by itself. Over 60% of the flights in the entire world are taken every day in the United States alone. So Isaiah is at some point 
apparently in the air where he can look down and all he sees is the shadows of these buzzing wings. Okay, number six. Mystery Babylon is the key commercial nation and engine of wealth for the world's economy. Okay, Revelations chapter 18, verses 17 through 19. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Check this out. Every shipmaster, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a, at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Okay, Revelations 18, 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Okay, this is so cool because the, the Bible is so exacting. The word abundance right here in Greek, means power by quantity. When I first looked that up in the Strong's Concordance, I was like, what is power by quantity? What does that mean, right? It's referring to buying power, okay? Mystery Babylon has made the world rich through its buying power, okay? Are you following me? When, the, when they measure how strong a country's economy is, uh, they measure it by its buying power. They call it the GDP, PPP, Global Domestic Product Purchasing Power Parity. That's what it's called. Here's a chart of the 2019 GDP PPP for the top 10 countries in the world. Now, hopefully you can read that from there, but besides China, the United States has two to five times the buying power over uh, any of the other top 10 nations in the world. The nations under that, we have like 20 to 50 times the buying power, okay? No other country in the world consumes more goods than United States besides China. The only reason why China is a little bit higher than the United States is because they have four times the amount of people we do. They have 1.4 billion people, right? And also, everybody knows that China manipulates their currency to make it look like they make more than what they really do, okay? If they were to go there to, to do this chart by person in country, China would be at the bottom. Uh, but because they're just doing it by overall volume, China's at the top right there. Okay, let's take a, look, a closer look. Okay, so, so basically what the Bible is saying is the merchants of the earth have become rich by her abundance, by her buying power. Okay, let's take another look at what Mystery Babylon trades in. Okay, because the Bible says it, it's very clear. Revelations 18, 12 through 13. She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragrant thawing wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood, and bronze, and iron, and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and bodies, that is, human slaves. Okay, now we don't have time to talk about all of these, but let's just talk about a couple of them real quick. Gold and silver. Do you know that there is more gold traded in the New York Comex in one day than all of the rest of the world put together in one day. That's how much gold we purchase in America, okay? And, and then on top of that, the same is true for silver and for copper, okay? Let's talk about diamonds. The U.S. by itself purchases over 20% of the whole entire world's diamonds every year, basically 24.4 billion worth. Fine linen, which we'll probably go over in a little bit, but those factories that, you know, foreign countries, you know, they're manufacturing clothes. Who are they manufacturing those clothes for? Human slaves. 
Each year, it's estimated that 16,000 foreign nationals are tra trafficked into the United States, which I believe it's probably a lot more than that, but the number of U.S. citizens trafficked within the U.S., they say is closer to 200,000 each year that are taken into the sex industry. And most of those, they say, are children. According, that's according to the Department of Justice. Okay. Rome and the Catholic Church have very little economic power, but they have absolutely no ability to be the economic engine for the whole world. If the U.S. vanished today, it would decimate the world's economy instantly. Why? Because we're the foremost country buying the goods of the world. Okay? These scriptures make it clear that whoever this nation is, the rest of the world depends on them to buy their merchandise. Mystery Babylon is the economic engine of wealth for the world's economy. Okay, let's go to number seven. Mystery Babylon loves its sensual pleasures. Okay, let's go to Ro Revelations 18.23. Revelations 18.23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. For by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. Let's go to Isaiah 47, 8. Therefore, hear this now, you who are given to pleasures. Revelations 18, 3 again. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the mer merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Okay? So these scriptures are saying that Mr. Ra Mystery Babylon uh, not only dabbled in sorcery and luxuries, but they indulged in sorcery and in the abundance of luxuries. Okay? The word luxury right there is referring to wanton luxury. Wanton meaning promiscuous, immoral, immodest, indecent, fast, loose, impure, lustful, corrupt, whorish, and disreputable. It's wanton luxury arising from the excess of wealth. Okay? In one word, you can call this debauchery. You know, ex excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. See, now, you cannot have sensual pleasure without stimulation of dopamine in your brain. Dopamine is the chemical that mediates pleasure in the brain. Okay, it's released during pleasurable activities, and it stimulates you to seek out pleasurable activities. Okay, let me give you some examples. Food, sugar, caffeine, sex, alcohol, addictive drugs, shopping, video games, power, gambling, and music, just to name a few, all stimulate dopamine to be released in the brain. Okay? All those things have their uses, but what I'm talking about is the abuse of those things. And I can't go over all of those, but it wouldn't take much of an argument to prove that America indulges in all of those. Okay? But I want to go over four of them. To start off with shopping. Okay? Revelations 18, 14. Man, the Bible goes into so much detail in this place. And the fruits that thy soul lusted after are departed from thee, and all the things which were dainty and goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. Okay? The fruits that thy soul lusted after, or you can say it like this, or all the things that are rich and glorious that thy soul lusts after perish from thee. Okay? The word dainty and the word goodly, uh, those are things that shine. Okay? In America, we like to use the word bling or ice or drip. I had to get those last two for my sons. <laughs> Bring me up to date a little bit. <laughs> it means things that are finely finished or coated, something embroidered, embroidered, something that stands out, something that is bright or splendid. It's talking about expensive clothing, jewelry, and fine furniture. Okay? The U.S., check this out, the U.S. represents 5% of the world's population, but we consume 60% of the world's goods. Only 5%. Do you know that if you own a house, 
that you're in the top 1% richest in the world. If you own a car, you're in the top 5% richest in the world. If your annual income is $33,000 a year, $16.18 an hour, you are in the top 5% richest in the world. The, um, if you make $50,000 or more a year, roughly $24.50 an hour, you're in the top 1% richest in the world. Okay? The bottom 85% of the world, the entire world, makes less than $2,200 a year. That comes out to about $1.08 an hour. People on welfare in the United States, SSI and unemployment, make more than that. Our poor are richer than most of the people in the world. We just don't know it. Okay? And here we are, walking around with $500 purposes, $500 video game consoles, $500 iPads, $800 cell phones, $300 watches, $200 shoes, and $200 pairs of jeans, right? Whether you realize it or not, compared to the rest of the world, we live luxuriously like kings and queens. Americans love their name brand clothing. They love having the coolest furniture. They love having the hottest cars, the biggest houses, expensive purses, watches, shoes, jewelry, toys, electronics, makeup, accessories, dot, 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 right? This is what happens when you have excess wealth. Okay, so let's talk about another one, food. Yikes. <laughs> I'm still on a hangover from this weekend. Okay. The United States is the number one out of the largest countries in the nation for obesity. An estimated 65% of adults in the U.S. are overweight or abuse. And so much so that it leads to the loss of 300,000 lives a year, people that die just from obesity. Okay, here's a pic right here. This is a diagram displaying obesity among adults by country. Okay, now it's not by overweight, it's by just obesity on this one. You can see on the left side, now you guys, I know you guys can't read that, but on the left side, America is the most obese, obese nation in the world. Okay, that's the bottom line right there in the blue. It's 38% uh, of our population is obese. That's people 15 years and older, okay? And they're expecting that number to increase to 50% by the year 2030, okay? Now, what you can't see is the second one on there is Mexico. And so if you're a Mexican living in the U.S., you got problems. <laughs> Just say that. Okay, and I have, sorry, women, but it just happened to be on the same chart. I didn't make up this chart. This is the only one that I could find that was up to date. But on the other side right there in the pinkish red, the bottom line all the way to, in the, that goes out the furthest, that is the difference between men and women. The women are the light pink and the men are the, are the, are the red. And so basically what it's stating is, is that the women in America are the most obese in the world. Just so you know, okay? That was the only up-to-date chart they had, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> okay, Food stimulates dopamine, and that's why it can be enjoyable, right? This is why some people get upset when their food is not made correctly. Mm -hmm. Because for them, food... Is more, it does more than just satisfy their hunger. There's pleasure in eating our favorite foods, right? That's where you get the phrase comfort food from, right? I'm sure none of us would know anything about that, but just for your information, okay? The U.S. is the world's worst abuser of food, okay? Anyone coming from a foreign country, one of the first things that they say when they come into the United States is, that they notice is the size of the portion of food that we serve, right? We love big portions here, okay? Americans eat 815 billion calories of food each day, okay? That's roughly 200 billion calories that we don't need each day, okay, or excess. Do you know that that 200 billion calories will feed 80 million people a day per day? Americans throw out 200,000 tons of edible food 
every day. And why? Because we can. That's why. Okay? Let me go to the next one. Sexual pleasure. The Babylonian goddess Ishtar, in English is actually called Easter, was the promoter of salvation by sex. You would have sex with a temple priest or priestess, and then you would be purified from your sins. Of course, without not, you know, without you have to give a donation to the church first, but still. Sexual pleasure these days comes in many forms. Pornography, sexting, promiscuous webcam videos, chat rooms, legal and illegal prostitution, and of course, all fornication, which would be adultery, homosexuality, transsexuality, and any other perversions of sex outside of the marriage of a man and a woman. Okay? Did you know that 89% of the pornography made in the world is made in the United States? 89%. You know, and this just came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's disturbing. Uh, one of the biggest porn sites is called Pornhub. Check this out. Amazon gets 2.4 billion hits per month. That's online visits, 2.4 billion. Do you know how much Pornhub gets per month? 3.5 billion hits per month. And I just, I just learned this. Did you know that on Pornhub, people can upload videos anonymously without proof of age or consent? So you don't know how old those people really are on those videos. So that site is a breeding zone for human traffickers, sexual slavery, and the sexual expo exploitation of children. The U.S. has infected the whole world with our sexual freedom and promiscuity. Let's go to Isaiah first, uh, chapter 3, verse 9. And the look on their countenance witnesses against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have brought evil upon themselves. See, they declare their sin as Sodom. The people of mystery Babylon commit sin publicly without fear of God and without shame. Okay, let's go to the last one right here. Drugs. Let's go to Revelation 18, verse 23. By your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. The, the Greek word for sorcery right here is the word pharmakeia. We use the word pharmacy in English. This speaks of medicinal drugs, where at least they're supposed to be used for medicinal purposes. The U.S. is the world's largest consumer of illicit drugs. Again, we just make up 5% of the, of the global population, but we consume 30% of the entire world's illicit drugs. Mystery Babylon loves its sensual pleasures. Amen. Now, I'm going to end it right here today. Okay, on Wednesday, uh, we're going to talk about Mystery Babylon. Why is it called the mother of harlots? What is the judgment for Mystery Babylon? And more importantly, what are the Christians doing during this judgment? Okay, this is not one that you're going to want to miss on Wednesday. Okay, let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Maybe you are in here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But you do know that you need to get your heart right with God. And there's no reason for you to be concerned about this prophecy at all if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Jesus said we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. The Bible says that Jesus knocks at the door of our hearts, and if we'll open the door, he will come in. If you would like to receive Jesus in your heart, I want you to lift up your hand where I can see it and put it back down. Is there anybody in here that would like to receive Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior? Raise up your hand where I can see it and then put it back down. Is there anybody here? Amen. Anybody here that wants to receive Jesus as their Savior? Or maybe you've known the Lord, but somewhere along the way you got caught up in the created things and you lost focus of the Creator, just like the Christians of Mystery Babylon. If that's you, I want you to lift up your hand where I can see it and put it back down. Is there anybody here? You're, you've backslid. I mean, I see that hand back there. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? 
Amen. Raise up your hand where I can see it. You say, Brother David, pray for me. I need Jesus. Raise up your hand where I can see it. Is there anybody else in here? Amen. Okay, well, all those that raised your hand, I'd like you to please get out of your seat and come up to this altar so we can pray with you. Amen. The one that raised your hand back there, come on up. Amen. We're going to pray with you, sister. Amen. Come on up here, sister. Let's all stand right now and as we begin to worship to the Christians in here today. I'm going to talk more about this on Wednesday, but where is your resting place? What is it that you fill your life with? Some people rest and they're nurtured and filled by eating and, and shopping. Some get lost in video games and romance novels. Others turn to porn or sex or drugs. Pastor's been speaking all this month on getting our heart right with God. We need to get our priorities straightened out. What comes first, created things or the creator? If you want to get your heart right on something so you're ready for the return of Jesus, then this altar is open. Amen.